Over the past century, it has become increasingly apparent that various civilized cultures have thrived in the Americas for thousands of years. However, it seems one group was the mother culture of all Mesoamerican civilizations, and they were known as the Almacs. But just exactly who were the Almacs? Where did they come from? And how did they make such great leaps in astrology, engineering, and art? Let's find out together. Who are the Olmecs? Over 2,500 years ago, while parts of the Mediterranean, such as Greece, were experiencing a golden age of culture, a mysterious and complex civilization was approaching its end in Central America. This society was known as the Olmecs. Little is known of the culture except for the fact they played a prominent role in the advancement of several other later peoples of Central America, including the Mayas, the Toltecs, and the Aztecs. The Olmecs left very few written records, yet archaeologists have discovered a few unusual collections of symbols that could eventually prove to be a hieroglyphic writing system. What the Olmecs did leave behind, however, was a vast amount of art and sculptures in the form of megalithic heads, images of gods, and even men morphing into jaguars. The Olmec civilization arose along the Gulf Coast of southern Mexico sometime around 1500 BC, but possibly much earlier. They developed their unique culture in a fertile region known as the Coatzocoalcos River Basin. This allowed the Olmecs to grow at a substantial rate in a similar fashion to other cultures that arose in fertile regions such as the Indus, Nile, and Euphrates. While archaeologists have worked on various sites associated with the Olmecs, including La Venta, San Lorenzo, and Laguna de los Cerros, their ethnic origins are still up for debate. The complex society has puzzled researchers for well over a century. We don't even know what they called themselves. The name Olmec is actually what the Aztecs called them, and it meant rubber people. Their presence was known throughout Central America, and they had extensive trade routes that stretched from their homeland in southern Mexico as far away as present-day Nicaragua. They traded a wide variety of items, including stones such as obsidian, serpentine, mica, jade feathers, mirror, and of course, rubber. The Achievements of the Olmecs The Olmecs are credited with much of the progression of Central American culture. It's been suggested they may have been the progenitors of the advanced calendrical systems used by various other Mesoamerican cultures, including the Maya and the Aztecs. It is also believed that the Olmecs had a concept of zero, which was vital in the creation of the Long Count Calendar. If scholars could decipher what the strange hieroglyphic symbols mean, it would also prove that the Olmecs were the first people in Central America to use a writing system. The Olmecs are created with creating the fascinating Mesoamerican ball game that was a realistic part of society. But one of the best little known fact is that the Olmecs were the first to discover chocolate. They harvested the cocoa beans and used them to create an unsweetened and bitter drink that likely had a various health benefit. But most impressive of all was the Olmec architecture. It seems they were the first of the Mesoamericans to begin a tradition of pyramid building. One of their best preserved examples is the Great Pyramid of La Venta. It stands out at a respectably 34 meters high and was constructed using over 100,000 cubic meters of earth. However, what the Olmecs are best known for are the enormous megalithic stone heads, typically carved from basalt. These heads can range in height from one meter to three and a half. These captivating heads portray the level of craftsmanship that was available during their era. The stones were brought from the Sierra de los Tuxtlas Mountains of Veracruz. Considering some of the larger heads weigh approximately 60 tons, the rough slabs could have weighed over 100 tons and would have been transported over 50 miles to the sculptors. 
The religious aspects of Olmec culture are also thought to have influenced later cultures. Evident from their various motifs, the Olmecs had a vast pantheon of deities that they revered. This included jaguars, dragons, maze gods, and even a feathered serpent. The serpent would be a symbol heavily worshipped all across later cultures, including the Maya, where he was known as Kukulkan and Kuketzel by the Aztecs. The Olmecs also have a special connection with natural places such as cenotes, deep bodies of water, and even caves. To them, this represented a connection with the sky above the water and the underworld below it. Where did the Olmecs come from? One of the most intriguing aspects of the Olmec culture is researchers really can't decide where they came from. While various theories have been put forth, they are all yet to be proven. One popular theory put forth by alternative thinkers is that they came from the Indus civilization following its eventual demise. The Indus people thrived in modern-day Pakistan and northwest India along the fertile Indus river plains. The Olmecs and Indus cultures share various similarities, including an avid fascination with astrology and the agrarian lifestyle. One of the main points for suggesting the Olmecs originated is based on the discovery of hundreds of small figures that supposedly depict yogic poses. It's thought that the practice of yoga first began in the Indus religion before it spread throughout much of India and Eastern Asia. Another major factor is that the Indus Valley began to decline around the year 1800 BCE, just a few centuries before the rise of the Olmecs. The theory that the Olmecs originated in the Indus Valley isn't too far from what mainstream archaeologists believe. The most popular theory put forth by academia is that the Olmecs originated in Asia, but like other Native Americans, they entered North America during the last great ice age. But is there a chance that the following major collapse of civilization in the Indus Valley and the abandonment of cities such as Mohenjo-Daro, could the Olmecs have sailed to Central America? Others have suggested that some kind of African origin for the Olmecs due to the facial features found on some of the megalithic carved heads. While this may have been more of a fantasy, some scholars still argue that many figures have African-like features. However, this theory tends to be disregarded in favor of the Asian migration, the disappearance of the Olmec people. The Olmecs thrived on the southern coast of Mexico for well over a thousand years, but by the 4th century BC, the culture seems to have all but vanished. The various urbanized agriculture cities such as La Venta, were abandoned, and the Olmec people seem to have moved out of the once fertile region. Some researchers have suggested a combination of natural ecological changes and a reduction in the fertility of the area. Whatever the cause, it's still widely up for debate. However, one thing that's for certain is the stone heads, jade sculptures, and pottery in the Olmec style with their distinct motifs were no longer created. While this is a popular theory, another suggests that the Olmecs may have been pushed further south in Central America. Many of the sites associated with the Olmecs have suffered systematic or deliberate destruction that's been dated to the 4th century BC, which coincides with their disappearance. This destruction is clearly evident in the once great city of La Venta, where even to this day, blocks and rubble lie scattered around the site give the impression it was deliberately destroyed. One theory about the fate of the Olmec people suggests they moved to other areas of Central America. Since the Olmecs vanished around the same time that the Maya rose to prominence, it's been suggested that the Olmecs moved south in search of a new homeland. This has led some researchers to believe that Olmecs either became the Maya or intermarried with other native groups, thus beginning the era of the Maya. This makes sense in some regards as the Maya had a culture almost identical to earlier Olmecs. They adopted the calendar system and the ball game, and the Maya cities also had an agrarian lifestyle. The Maya even had a fascination with mathematics and astronomy, just like the Olmecs. 
the Olmecs have remained one of Mesoamerica's most mysterious and unique cultures. Their part in the advancement of the various Central American cultures paved the way for thriving civilizations to arise in this part of the world. Yet their mysterious origins and disappearances have left researchers baffled and fascinated for over a century. The ancient history of Western Europe is one of the most mysterious on Earth. Thousands of ancient monuments aligned with the stars are littered across the islands. The legends of their divine creators are still passed on to this day. But just who created these megalithic stone circles and monoliths, and how does it all relate back to ancient civilization that has its origin in the American highlands? And what do ancient groups such as the Anunnaki, Tuatha de Danann, and the Shining Ones have to do with it all? Let's find out. The Highlands of Scotland are one of the most magical places on planet Earth. This ancient territory is full of dramatic mountains, thick forests, and a mesmerizing coastline and is easily considered one of the most beautiful places on Earth. Amongst the high coastal plains of the highlands lie a vast sway of unusual megalithic stone circles and standing monoliths unlike elsewhere in Europe. These features of the landscape date back thousands of years to a time when humans were considered mere hunters and unaware of metal tools supposedly to an era when a group of gods, known as the Shining Ones, thrived in the isolated part of the world. Around 8,000 years ago, a revolution occurred on the isolated island of Orkney and the Western Isles of Scotland. An outstanding collection of stone circles, standing stones, round towers, and passage mounds appeared seemingly out of nowhere. Such monuments were foreign to Scotland during the air, but parallels are common in regions of the Caspian Sea and Mediterranean regions. The creators of these monuments were equally mysterious. Very little oral tradition has survived to this day about the ancient builders. The most popular legend comes to us from the medieval period. When the first Scandinavians first arrived in Orkney, they said there were surviving folklore on the island, speaking of two types of people who had once inhabited the island. They were called the Papai and the Peiti. However, these mysterious groups had long vanished by the time the Scandinavians settled on the islands. Another name for this group was the Shining Ones. Legends remember the Shining Ones as physically different from the older Neolithic inhabitants who were of small stature and likely dark haired with brownish eyes. Instead, the Shining Ones would have looked almost surprisingly like the later Celtic people. They were light-skinned, fair-haired, and taller than the island's locals of ancient times. In this regard, they bore a great similarity with the Scandinavians, which must have brought about a strange sensation in their thought of Nordic peoples as they listened to the legends. The ancient Papai were recalled as very mysterious peoples. They must have been fairly significant to be immortalized in local tradition. The legends speak of their large, long limbs, which flowed out of white tunics. They were regarded as master astronomers with an uncanny ability to work with enormous stones and lived away from the native populations of the island. But where did these relatively advanced ancient architects come from? The Unique Sites of Orkney Legends state that it was the Shining Ones who built the unique megalithic sites of Orkney. This include Orkney's Ring of Brodgar and the Standing Stones of Stennis. These are but two of a vast amount of unusual sites on Scotland's Western Isles, but ones which has fascinated scholars for centuries. But why did the Shining Ones go to such extreme lengths to create sites precisely aligned with various celestial bodies? It seems the positioning of the Stennis stones was no coincidence. The builders specifically chose a site on high ground that overlooked the lake below, 
17th century paintings show a quadrangle of vast standing stones resembling a court. It's thought that the standing stones was used to calculate the extreme rising and settling of the sun and moon and a place of assembly where people gathered. Stennis actually remained as a place of the council in Orkney, right until they built the main town of Kirkwall. Not far to the northwest of Stens lies the intact ring of Brodgar, a collection of 27 sandstone monoliths. While there were once 56 stones at this site, the remains are enough to understand what exactly the site was used for. The sanding stones perfectly line with solar and lunar cycles, proving this ancient site worked as a fully functioning calendar over 7,000 years ago. There are even more unusual alignments that link all of these sites together. The axis on which stands the Ring of Brodgar are a few other sites in the region follow is a southeast trajectory of 129 degrees. This perfectly aligns with the winter solstice of 6800 BC, a fact that greatly surprised researchers as no culture should have been building sites this far north with such precision at such a distant part of our past. Our last point concerning the sites is one which continues to blow the mind of astronomers around the world. The three main stone circles which run along the Orkney Archipelago have a spatial relationship to the Great Pyramids of Giza. When overlaid on a survey, the tip of each pyramid lies directly in the center of each stone circle. This has led to speculation that the pyramid's builders built these ancient megalithic sites in Scotland first. Scholars ultimately still need to answer such questions concerning Scotland's ancient past. Just who were these shining ones and how did they arrive on the Western Isle? And most importantly, why? The Origin of the Shining Ones Freddie Silva is one of the main researchers on the origin and identity of the Shining Ones. In his seventh book, Scotland's Hidden Sacred Past, he examines the Neolithic culture, Gaelithic language, and scattered traditions of the Scottish Isles. He finds a trail of evidence leading to Sardinia and the Armenian Highlands. Freddie's research led him to locate the origin of this misplaced civilization and what prompted its people to choose the furthest reaches of Europe to recreate the masterworks of their original homeland, a plan that included the establishment of Ireland's religious and megalithic culture. The traditional theory of migration of fair-haired peoples into Western Europe has us believe that settlers transversed across Europe, up through France, entering into Southern Britain, and from there to Scotland and Ireland during the early Bronze Age. However, Freddy somewhat disagrees with this statement and believes he has found evidence to contradict this. He suggests that a much more ancient migration had taken place. Freddy thinks that the Shining Ones were seafarers who had actually bypassed the British Isles and arrived first in the Scottish Highlands at places like Orkney and from there onto Northeast Ireland. But this idea would contest of the mainstream academics who imply DNA studies provide us with evidence that claims that the Neolithic ancestors of Western Europe were of Middle Eastern or Anatolian descent. But there be another side to this ancient story. The Shining Ones and Anaki to Othada. Lewis, Orkney, and Ireland's Isles share a common ancestor in these megalithic builders who were referred to as the Shining Ones. This is somewhat traced through genetics and migrational patterns. Freddy believes the story of the Shining Ones can be traced back to Armenia. He does promote Armenia as one of the cradles of civilization. The Armenian language inherit in 55% of Germanic languages and is linked to Irish and Celtic languages. Evidence such as this helped him to theorize who was behind the making of Scotland's giant stone circles and megaliths. This brought about the theory that the Shining Ones are, in fact, the oldest branch of the Tuatha de Danann of Irish legends. He claims that hidden within Irish mythology 
is an ancient story that speaks of this migration. A further link arrives in the name of deity worshipped by the Irish gods of mythology. The Tuatha Danann worshipped a goddess known as Anu, and it just so happens that this is also one of the highest ranking deities of the Anunnaki pantheon. Yet little to no legends exist of this deity in summer. Could this be because Anu was adopted into the Sumerian pantheon from outside interference? Interestingly, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed people of Scandinavia, along with the shining ones of Scotland and Ireland, can be traced back to Armenia and the Black Sea area. Papai, the name of the shining ones in Orkney folklore, means a holy person or monk, whereas in Armenian. The other word used in the legends, pati, relates to an Egyptian word meaning a heavenly being or a region of the sky giving us the idea that these people were astronomers or perhaps something more than that. An idea we will explore in a future video. By about 6000 BC, the Shining Ones had moved north from their homeland in Armenia to Siberia, west around Ukraine and the Black Sea, and by about 5000 BC, the area became known as Scythia. This was a massive sway of territory and their royal peoples would gather around stone circles and round towers. These people took this up to Denmark, up to the river Danube, and gave the genetic line to the Scandinavian people. The blonde and red-haired and blue-eyed people and these people eventually made it into Orkney, the Hebrides, and Northern Ireland. The people of Anu likely have their origin in the highlands of Armenia, also known as the Caucasus Mountains and even Northern Samaria. The people of Armenia called themselves the people of Orion. This is interesting as we see clear worship of Orion in both ancient Egypt and Western Europe. A final shred of evidence that links the Shining Ones and Tuatha Dadana to Armenia comes to us from one of Ireland's most ancient sites, Terra. In legends, this site is where the king of the Tuatha Dadana ruled from, the name Terra just so happens to be the name of the ancient Armenian deity. So what do you think about today's video? Do you see a connection between the Anunnaki of Sumerian legends and the Tuatha Dadana of Irish mythology? And could both of these groups be traced back to ancient civilization that originates in the Armenian highlands? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and like to see more like it on a unique and mysterious parts of ancient history, then be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel.